Hello and welcome to the third session of this webinar series on agricultural crop classification with synthetic aperture radar and optical remote sensing. I'm Erica Podest, scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and RSET instructor. Today's session is a crop inventory roadmap. Our guest lecturer is Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson, who's a scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And as a reminder, this webinar series consists of five sessions. Today is the third session, and it's the first part of an operational crop roadmap. It's focused on SAR today. The second part will be on Thursday, October 14th, and that will be focused on the optical part and in merging both optical and SAR. The last session will be on Tuesday, October 19th, and that will be focused on biophysical variable retrieval using optical satellite data to support agricultural monitoring practices. By the end of this training, participants will learn how to access and select Sentinel-1 SAR images, um, how to pre-process Sentinel-1 data, field training and adequate field data collection, and the use of SNAP for pre-processing of Sentinel-1 images and subsetting and stacking data. There will be one homework assignment posted on the training page on the last day of the webinar series. Answers must be submitted by Google Form by the due date of November 2nd. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of November 2nd. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marines Martins. Now I'll pass it on to Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson. Thank you very much, Laura, for sharing your expertise and your knowledge on a crop inventory roadmap. I know you've worked on this for many years and we're really thrilled that uh, you're sharing all of this experience with um, RSET. So thank you and welcome. Hello, my name is Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson and I work in research and development at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, AAFC, using SAR and optical satellites for mapping and monitoring agriculture in Canada. In this session, I will provide a step-by-step -step roadmap on how to operate an earth observation-based operational crop inventory at country level using SAR and optical satellite imagery and open source processing tools. Canada is the world's second largest country in landmass at just under 10 million square kilometers. Ca Canada's agricultural landscape is large and complex. There are over 193,000 farms and 64 million hectares of total farm area. That's slightly bigger than the size of the entire country of France and its five overseas regions. In 2009, AAFC began generating annual crop type digital maps for the prairie provinces using satellite imagery and expanded the annual crop inventory, ACI, to the entire agricultural extent of Canada in 2011. The ACI is an annual crop inventory that is produced at the end of the growing season. Its overall target accuracy is at least 85%. The final spatial resolution is 30 meters. It is national in scale, and it is an operational program with a mostly automated workflow. The crop inventories are published on the Government of Canada's open data portal and include an AAFC geospatial viewer. AAFC started the national monitoring endeavor through research and development projects to determine if SAR and optical satellite imagery could be used to classify agriculture regions. The R&D projects use test site sites spread across the agriculture extent of Canada to capture the variability of crop types, field sizes, growing seasons, and tested different classification methodologies and SAR and optical processing choices. 
The result of these endeavors is this annual map you see here that has been produced nationally for over 10 years. This is the agriculture extent of Canada. Crops generally do not grow in much abundance north of these latitudes due to the shortened growing season and that area, which is mostly forests, wetlands, etc., is mapped and monitored by other departments of the Government of Canada. This agriculture inventory classifies all agriculture and other land covers within the agricultural extent, resulting in approximately over 40 different agriculture classes and 10 land use land cover classes. The variation in crop types, field sizes, and shapes makes this crop inventory endeavor unique in the challenges that must be met. Fields in the prairie provinces, such as those shown in the here in the Tabor Alberta figure, are large, typically square, and with some irrigation, which are seen here as circles. And farms on average are very large, around 450 hectares. Crop types typically are small grains, such as wheat, oats, barley, rye, along with canola, dry peas, sugar beets, fodder corn, and hay. Fields in the province of Quebec are long and narrow, as seen in the figure of Richelieu River, with average area per farm of about 180 hectares. And crop types are typically corn, soy, and oats, along with fruits, berries, vegetables, and hay. Fields on the East Coast are typically very small, as seen on the central Prince Edward Island figure, with farm sizes averaging about 170 hectares. Crops are typically small grains like wheat, oats, and barley that are grown alongside canola, corn, and soybeans. Prince Edward Island is the largest producer in Canada of potatoes, all of the pink fields on that figure. You can see that just with these three examples, there's quite a variety of crop types, field sizes, and field configurations. The AAFC crop inventory method relies on an integration of data from Canadian radar set SAR satellites and optical satellites such as Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. Sentinel 1 SAR satellite from ESA is currently being integrated. This RSAT training will use Sentinel 1 and Sentinel 2 data given the global access to these data. Participants will use open source SNAP software. While taking this course, and while you're thinking about how to adapt these methodologies, considerations should be made based upon the local cropping systems in your region. And these considerations should include, what is the growing season? What are the crop mixes in your area? What are the crop management practices? How are the field and parcel sizes differing? And what field data collection strategies do you have? This flowchart outlines each of the steps that are taken from the Earth Observation Data Acquisition to the final product publication. Each of these steps will be considered in detail in the next slides and in session four. But here you can see the overall process is, one, acquiring and processing the satellite data, two, collecting, checking, and controlling training and validation data, three, working with regions for classification, four, applying the classification to regional data stacks of earth observation data and training and validation data, and five, final product, product production, including post-processing, quality checking, and publication. First, we will discuss acquiring and pre-processing Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. For the AAFC ACI, we utilize Application Programming Interfaces, APIs, to download Landsat, Sentinel-1, and Sentinel-2 data and pull acquired Radarsat Constellation mission data. We download and process thousands of optical and SAR images every year to cover the entire agricultural extent across the whole growing season. AFC uses about one SAR image per month, but research has demonstrated that dense stacks of SAR imagery throughout the growing season will improve classification accuracies. C-band data are available from Sentinel-1 satellites. 
both A and B. Sentinel-1 satellite has a 12-day exact repeat. The two satellites provide a six-day repeat at the equator in the interferometric wide IW swath mode. These can be provided as single look complex data or ground range detected data. And ground range detected can come in one of three resolutions, full, high, and medium resolution. In general, best of results for classifications of agricultural landscapes are found when using a VV and VH polarization, which can either be derived from SLC or GRD products. To simplify processing, we will use IW interferometric wide GRD data. Research has demonstrated that polymetric parameters and multi frequencies improve accuracies, and this should be part of your consideration when considering your future crop inventories. Typically for crop classification, ground reach detected SAR data is sufficient. The Sentinel-1 GRD product in high resolution is a multi-look times five in the range direction and by one times in the azimuth direction and is projected in the ground range. This means that the phase information is lost. VV and VH dual polarization is preferred and is generally what is available for Sentinel-1 over land. The Sentinel-1 image also has a 250 kilometer swath, making it preferable for large region operational mapping. AAFC uses all optical images with minimal cloud coverage. The number of images with minimal cloud coverage varies by region in Canada and by year. The integration of radar with optical ensures that we obtain full spatial and temporal coverage during the growing season. In general, for our optical image selection, our data is coming from Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2A and B. Sentinel-2 has a revisit time of 10 days at the equator with one satellite and five days with two satellites, two or three days repeats at the mid-latitudes. Landsat-8 has about a 16-day exact repeat coverage. And in some areas, there will be higher revisits where over orbits overlap, providing additional acquisitions. However, cloud coverage may reduce the number of optical images that may be available for your annual crop inventory. Generally, Sentinel-2 are available as level 1C or level 2A. If level 2A, which is corrected to the bottom of atmosphere reflectance, are not available for download, Sentinel-2 images can be corrected using SNAP and the Sen2 core processor. Sentinel-2 imagery are sectioned into granules, which are also known as tiles and are about 100 by 100 kilometers squared. As seen here in the lower corner image in a grid format. They are also orthorectified and have a UTM WGS84 projection. Sentinel-2 data can be downloaded from the European Space Agency's Copernicus Hub or using the USGS Earth Explorer. As I mentioned, the Sen2 core processor can be used for generating the level 2A products, and it can be used as a function in SNAP or separately using command line functioning. AAFC's annual crop inventory typically only uses six bands that correspond to the green, red, blue, near infrared and the two short way infrareds similar to the band the the bands available on landsat other bands available from sentinel 2 including the vegetation red edges may prove to provide important information for certain crop types and therefore investigation on the use of those bands may be warranted in your region One way to access Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 imagery is through Copernicus Hub. If searching for a specific area, try and minimize the area of interest, the date range of interest, and even the data types, for example, from only choosing ground range detected. 
in order to reduce the number of returns on your search forms. If you're looking to use these operationally, investigate the use of application programming interface or APIs and cloud computing. Another site available for Sentinel-1 downloads is the Alaska Satellite Facility. There are a lot of options for downloading data from this site, including pre-processed interferometric products. Understanding the naming convention of Sentinel-1 data is important. The first three letters is the mission, either Sentinel-1A or Sentinel-1B. The B mode is the next two digit characters, which could be IW, interferometric wide, EW, extra wide, strip map, or wave. And typically for crop mapping, as we mentioned, you will probably use interferometric wide. The next most important information is the date and time which gives you the sensing date. And that's located as start date and time. For Sentinel-2, similarly, there is important parts of the naming convention to look at. The first is the product level. Here you will learn if the product is the level 1C, not corrected, or level 2A, which is corrected to bottom of atmosphere reflectance. The sensing time, again, is another important aspect, as it will tell you when the image was acquired. For pre-processing Earth observation data, there are two main paths. For the Sentinel-1 GRD data, we first apply an orbit file, then apply a speckle filter, then a geometric correction, and finally, if you're interested in a specific area of interest, you would subset. For the Sentinel-2 L1C data, you would apply the Sen2 core atmospheric correction with an L2A output, and again, if interested in a specific area of interest, you would subset. These data are all subsequently co-registered together and then exported as GeoTIFF or BigTIFF format to be used in other classifiers. The first step of processing is applying the precise orbit file. Satellite positions are recorded by a global navigation satellite system. To ensure a fast delivery of Sentinel-1 products, orbit information is generated by an onboard navigation solution that is stored within the Sentinel-1 Level 1 products. Orbit positions are later refined by the Copernicus Precise Orbit Determination, the POD service. Precise orbit files have a less than five centimeter accuracy and are delivered within 20 days after the data acquisitions. The accuracy of restituted orbit files is less than 10 centimeters. These files are available three hours after data acquisitions. It is important to apply the precise orbit file to ensure positional accuracy. Speckle filtering the SAR data is the next step in pre-processing. As you've previously learned, there is often noise within a SAR image that needs to be minimized during the pre-processing period. And for agriculture, this is to make fields more homogenous for classification. Speckle filtering will take care of that. There really is no simple answer, however, in the selection of filter size and type, and it's highly dependent on the target of interest and whether they are a point target or a distributed target, and what the target size is. Field size and configuration may be important when you're considering the size of the filter to use. Testing should be done when you're determining the size of the filter that you choose. Just as filter size is important, the type of filter you choose will also be important. Adaptive filters minimize the homogeneous area noise while maintaining edge effects. The adaptive filters listed here, all in green, are all available in SNAP. Multi-temporal filters typically remove noise based on an assessment of a time series stack of SAR imagery. The multi-temporal filter will average temporal components that are typically statistically homogeneous throughout time, while maintaining features that do not meet the homogeneous criteria. Multi-temporal filtering methods can minimize noise from homogeneous areas However, they have an assumption that those areas remain unchanged through time. The multi-temporal filter is also available through SNAP. 
Other filter types not available include multi-resolution filters, and these do not assume an unchanging and consistent response through space and time. The 2Z filter is an example of a multi-resolution filter and has a five-step adaptive process that includes point target filtering, curvilinear filtering, homogeneous area filtering, multi-resolution, edge detection, and filtering of stationary areas. Non-local filters also consider pixels in a patchwise manner, where the importance of a pixel is weighed through a comparison of similar patches throughout the whole image. A lot of these filter types are very computationally heavy, so consideration should be made from an operational perspective of the benefit of the filtering type and the computational time. As I mentioned, it is important to test the type of filters you use along with the size of the filter for the particular region of interest. These results here show that overall accuracies and response will change with changing filter size and type due to the differing field sizes and shapes. You can see with the gamma map results, the overall accuracies did improve for each of the three test sites in Canada, Argentina, and the USA as your filter size increased until an overall peak accuracy was reached at approximately of a filter size of 11 by 11. When AFC was developing our methodology for our annual crop inventory, we tested these features at that time, and we continue to test these features as you see here to make improvements where we can, and as different filter types become more available. AFC uses the gamma map filter, which is based on the assumption that the unspeckled intensity of the underlying scene is gamma distributed. The filter will minimize the loss of the texture information better than a frost or leaf filter within gamma distributed scenes. On here, you can see the difference between the unfiltered HV image on the left and the gamma map 7x7 filtered image on the right. The filtered image is obviously less pixelated and more, the fields are more homogeneous. The next step in SAR preprocessing is a radiometric conversion and calibration. So Sentinel-1 level 1 products are not radiometrically corrected or calibrated by default. So radar re reflectivity is stored as digital numbers or DNs in an S1 products and these must be converted to physical units, radar backscatter. To apply radiometric correction and calibration, a calibration annotation data set, CADS, with four lookup tables is provided within the Sentinel-1 products in the XML files. The S1 instrument processing facility automatically applies corrections for elevation antenna pattern and range spreading loss. The lookup tables that are provided are then applied, uh, then apply a product scaling factor and a calibration coefficient and a conversion for local incidence angle. The radar cross section of a target, which is the equivalent area seen by a radar and is the measure of a target's ability to reflect radar signals in the direction of the radar receiver. The radar cross section lookup tables, whether for sigma, beta, or gamma, can be simplified and contain the area normalization factor and calibration constant. Data are calibrated to sigma naught and beta naught and gamma naught using these following formulas. In general, for agricultural monitoring, we use data that are calibrated to sigma naught. If a more precise sigma naught is required, knowledge of the local slope is also needed through a digital elevation model. This process is known as radiometric normalization, and a SAR image can be normalized to a local incidence angle, a projected local incidence angle, or incidence angle derived from an ellipsoid. To reduce the effect of changes in backscatter across swath due to incidence angle, a cosine correction can be applied. However, the weighting factor in this correction is target dependent, with the drop and backscatter in the range being dependent on the roughness and the vegetation structure. This can be seen here in the graph on the right, 
where there is a change in backscatter with increasing incidence angle for different soil types and different canopy covers. AFC conducted testing on large swath SAR images such as Sentinel-1 IW 250 km swath or RaiderSat-2 standard or wide modes at 100 km to 150 km swaths that indicated that radiometric normalization for sigma naught using a DEM to a local projected or a local, a projected local or ellipsoid incidence angle was important to minimize crop class variability across these large swaths. This type of normalization is not as important for smaller swaths typical of experimental sites, but is critical for data that is used in a large scale operational monitoring. The fourth step is terrain correction or orthorectification and refers to the correction of the image to a known coordinate system and removes the effects of angle and terrain. This type of correction requires also a digital elevation model. There are a few types of terrain correction methods that are available in SNAP, including the RAGE Doppler and SAR simulation models. AAFC's annual crop method typically uses a rational polynomial coefficient model, but for this research purposes, set with Sentinel-1, we typically use the range Doppler method available in SNAP. The Sentinel-1 GRDH image does not have geographic coordinates. Images must be converted into a map coordinate system. The terrain correction with the use of digital elevation mo model data corrects to topographical distortions like foreshortening, layover, or shadowing, as you previously learned. The range Doppler terrain correction method implements an orthorectification method for geocoding SAR images from a single 2D raster radar geometry. It is available, it uses available orbit state vector information in the metadata, the radar timing annotations, the slant to ground range conversion parameters, together with the reference DEM data to derive the precise geolocation information. The next step in Earth observation pre-processing is to pre-process the Sentinel-2 optical data. For the AFC operational pre-processing methods, which include both Landsat-2 and Landsat-8 data, a manual review of imagery for cloud cover and image quality is conducted. If part of an image has limited cloud cover over specific regions of agriculture, then an image can be included in the classification regardless if the entire image is, has a high percentage of cloud cover. Therefore, if an area of the image over agriculture is cloud free or minimal clouds, it can be used. If desired, ESA has methodologies to remove cloud cover, including some that are available in SNAP. However, this will increase the overall processing effort and computational time. The pre-processing step for optical imagery has been described in more detail in previous webinars in this series. The Earth observation data preparation has been described and actual image processing will be demonstrated shortly. Now we will take a look at collecting training and validation data. Focus should be made now on the collection of training and validation data. This aspect is the single most important aspect of the classification process. Well dispersed, good quality and large quantity of reference data will ensure success with your classification process. This step should have as much or more focus than the Earth observation processing and acquisition. The following are the main steps that AFC follows to collect training and validation data. So AFC acquires field data for training and testing using two approaches. One, we have partnerships with crop insurance agencies for some of the provinces. That means the crop insurance agencies send us the information about what is growing on all the fields within those different provinces. The second approach is that we send crews to actually collect the in situ observations. Our guiding principles for in situ observations is that we are getting good coverage. The data points are very well dispersed to cover the areas of interest. 
We get large quantities of samples, especially for very rare or unusual crop types. And classifica classification success is highly dependent on quality of the ground data inputs. If you have poor ground data, you will have a poor classification. You can see in this image the extent of surveying that is completed in one growing season across southern Ontario, one part of one province. There are three teams here that go out. You can see them in red, green, and blue, and they blanket the areas over several weeks in the summer. To gather high quality field data, AAFC has devised a thorough training system to help new staff or students to become familiar with data collection methods. Previously, we used GPS enabled tablets with a proprietary survey tool that had been created and modified for Canada's collections needs to survey the provinces where we do not get the insurance data. We have been moving to applications that can be used on smart smartphones or other regular tablets, such as Esri's Survey123, which is a licensed product, or as well, the NGA MAG, which is app, which is a more open source type of tool. Here we have Leander Campbell from our Earth Observation team explaining the general process of surveying. This moment to just kind of show you what we have for a setup. Let me collect our data here. So what we have is a GPS enabled tablet that shows my precise location and I've overlaid that on top of some satellite imagery so I can see the boundaries of each field and what happens is when we pass the field and I look over and see that that's a corn field I can drop a point on the field and up will pop our menu and I can select from a various drop down menus and tabs different crop types and that's I can just select corn and it adds a point onto our field. So then we continue to do this repeatedly over the entire province of Ontario and then in other provinces where we don't have crop insurance. Generally, they go out in teams of two, a recorder and a driver, and the observations are actually made while they're driving and not stopped, as he was showing in the video. This is the general process of training that goes on each year for new staff or co-op students that we hire to do this kind of field work. The main points include extensive crop identification training, land cover training, and device training, which could be on our old tablets or using newer applications on smartphones or regular tablets. We do target training, which teaches the field surveyors where exactly to put the point of interest. We do regional training to ensure that surveys are familiar with particular crop types and cropping systems that are present in different parts of the country. And finally, the staff goes through simulations and test run practices to ensure that they're ready to acquire well-placed and well-identified field data. Some of the ways staff are taught identification are through these processes. They visit greenhouses. Staff can visit greenhouses on our campus to watch crops at various stages in growth. We have an extensive crop manual that staff review that document all crops that are grown across Canada. We have this regional training. Our staff familiarizes themselves with the types of crops grown in their assigned field work region. We also have a historical point review the staff will look at past data collection years to see which minor crops may have been spotted in certain parts in previous years. We do a street view slideshow using Google Maps. Staffs pretend to drive virtual paths and are asked to identify crops in the field. We do a crop slideshow. AASD created a rapid slideshow of crop photos staff are required to quickly identify as they are quickly displayed. One way to te easily teach identification is by using Google Street View. Staff pretend to drive from point A to point B as seen on the left. Staff will mark various cover on the satellite as they drive on Street View and they try to identify the land cover as best they can. Obviously, Street View is not necessarily in the current year and may not be in the growing season, but using this method can get the surveyor used to looking from side to side 
and to identify simple agricultural and land cover types. Some surveyors are unfamiliar with satellite imagery to start with and image recognition in general. We review satellite background imagery to become accustomed to how these images may appear on a device. We also spend a lot of time with device familiarization. This gives, takes spending time looking at the learning and looking at the different functions of the software, how to delete a point, how to add a point, how to load a layer, and reading through all the help files that were created. We also spend a lot of time on point placement. We work on them being able to correctly position data on top of the background imagery. And we run through a static identification of targets in the office. With a background image, we ask them to find perhaps 10 water features, six barns, seven forest classes, two golf courses, et cetera. Finally, the trainees go through land cover and crop target training, and this is prior to our actual field season. We take the trainee on a known route where they will be asked to collect land cover and crop target data. The trainee is then judged on correct identifications, positional accuracies, and volume of points. We provide this very extensive training because good quality field data is critical to the success and accuracy and quality of the overall inventory. Many times we're asked, how many samples are actually needed? Well, the simple answer is a lot. Overall, for the southern portion of Ontario, crews generally collect around 16,000 field observations. But often we wonder, can that number be reduced to if we need to reduce resources and time for field work? AFC ran an experiment to test the impact on accuracies by reducing the number of field data points used to train the classifier. We used, we reduced the number of field samples in our classification from 100% all the way down to 5%. And each time we reduced the number of field samples, we reclassified. Then we assessed the accuracies that were obtained. Overall, we found that we could reduce the number of field data points, but the overall accuracies eventually declined to below operational preferences. Therefore, a decision has to be made over what the overall accuracy is preferred. In our case, we strive for 85%. And how much are you willing to allow that to degrade to reduce field sampling? It's a very difficult decision. Here's another example of another region of Eastern Ontario. We had 100% of samples, over 6,700, where the overall accuracy was 85.4%. When we reduce that by 50%, our overall accuracy reduced to 84.3%. And then when we actually reduced it to 5%, our overall accuracy reduced to 81%. We do wanna keep accuracies near 85%, so it's important to assess these changes. In general though, we are looking for very spatially dispersed points that are representative of all crop types. After 10 years of experience, AFC has determined optimum sampling numbers for mapping crop types across Canada. New operational groups should acquire an, a maximum amount of samples as possible in the first years, but can then use these data to run similar experiments to, to determine what are the requirements for their regions. The next step, once the points are collected, are to go through an intense quality checking of reference data. We first scan attribute files for any flagged items and we read all the comments from the surveyors. The surveyor may not have known all the possible crop categories and might have placed the crops in a wrong class. For example, they might have selected other fruit with a written comment of blueberry. We will correct that and put that point in a blueberry class. If there are other questions, we also use the photos to reconcile. When a field surveyor has questions about what they are looking at, they do stop and take photos of the field of interest. Even our most experienced surveyors often have to stop and take a photo and take it back to the office to review. For minor or rare crops, 
we highlight on the map and check if they're in an expected location. For example, if berries cannot grow in a region, we would assume this is an erroneous observation. We, for, third, for our third step, we scroll along driving routes to make sure point placements are within fields. For example, points should not be on the roads or in forests or on billion buildings or in rivers. We adjust point locations if possible, otherwise we would delete a point. If we find multiple points have been placed in a single field, we make sure that the crop types match. While we're scrolling, if we can identify the crop type using the satellite image in the office, such as an orchard or a vineyard or ginseng, we verify that the observed crop class is correct. We also cross checkpoints where our surveyors data collections overlap. We purposely overlap our field routes to assist with our quality control. If observations differ, we select a majority observation. So if two out of three surveyors agree, we select that crop, crop class. We also review dates to determine if one surveyor's observation was taken at a better time for crop determination. And we consider the historical inaccuracies of the particular surveyor. Overall, when in doubt, throw it out. Next, we create polygons from the point data that was collected in the field. Given the amount of that we survey, it is not efficient to simply manually draw polygons. To change the point data to polygons, we first add a 500 meter buffer around each sampling point. This limits the area that will need to be segmented around the sample. Next, AAFC uses eCognition software to segment the imagery. There are other open source options available, such as QGIS or Python, and AFC is now looking at doing this segmenting step in Google Earth Engine. Next, the segment around the sampling point is extracted and is then considered the actual field boundary and the polygon that will be used as the training and validation sample. The training and validation sets are created from the polygon field data. We split the field data using a stratified random sampling method, ensuring that all classes are well represented in a region and that we have enough training and validation for all classes present, resulting in 30% of the field data split to validation and 70% split to training. We next rasterize all our vector samples and we add those, raster vector, those rasterized samples to our satellite co-registered data sticks. AAFC uses all in-house tools to do this, but these processes are available in R and Python and will be shown in the next section of the series, part four. The final pre-processing step we take is region building. So region building separates the data into manageable areas of interest. It would be impossible to try and classify the entire agricultural extent of Canada at one go. Therefore, we break it down into manageable bits. These sections can be based on grids, such as the S2 grid, or where maybe the imagery all overlaps, or by geopolitical boundaries, such as state lines or provincial lines, or if the country is not that large, could be by the entire country. Region building occurs just before the classification. AAFC's internal system now actually iterates regions over all pixels to ensure that the best coverage we each pixel is given the best coverage of images possible. We will not region build in the hands-on portion of this activity, but we'll subset our imagery to a common area of interest. AFC is often asked what staffing resources are used to create the annual crop inventory every year. Keeping in mind that Canada has 64 million hectares of total farm area to map, we have four permanent technical staff using 75% of their time that are required for data processing. And this does not exclude, this excludes their field work. We also need resources to collect the in situ field data for six provinces or approximately 8.5 million hectares. 
We have an overall budget of approximately 45,000 Canadian dollars a year, excluding the salary for the four permanent technical staff. As you can see from our graph, we have six provinces resulting in 8.5 million hectares that we need to survey. In the first column, we have Newfoundland, which has 28,000 hectares of farm acreage. We take one person, the first number, and four days, the numbers in brackets, to survey that area and provide enough field data. So forth and so on, you will see that for each of the provinces, we either have AFC's Earth Observation Team, which is our permanent technical staff, or we have AAFC students, which we hire part-time co-op students over the summer months. We have AFC that actually are in the province, which in Newfoundland, that is who actually does the field surveying. We partner with Statistics Canada, another Government of Canada agency who does surveying with us. We partner with provincial governments, such as OMAFRA, which is the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, or the BC government to also do surveying in those provinces. So overall, we have 26 individuals for 168 days of work to survey the 8.5 million cut a hectares, 8.5 million hectares. So that's 26 people for a total of 168 days or an average of 6.5 days per person. So now we will go and do our hands-on exercise for opening and pre-processing imagery with SNAP. If you have downloaded the Sentinel-1 SAR image, you can try and follow along with these processing steps on your own. Don't worry, this recording will be provided on the training website within 24 hours, so you can again apply and go at your own pace. So as you have already learned, SNAP is Sentinel's application platform. It is free and open source toolbox, and it's for processing and analyzing ESA and third-party Earth observation satellite imagery data. And as you've learned, you can download the latest installers from SNAP from ESA. There are the main steps that you need to follow for star pre-processing. Is opening a Sentinel-1 IW GRDH image, apply an orbit file, apply a speckle filter, complete the geometric correction with the range Doppler, complete the geometric correction with the range Doppler model. And at this point, this is where the radiometric normalization and conversion to sigma naught occurs. And then you will have your pre-processed SAR data. First, we will start with opening a Sentinel-1 image. You can do this by doing File, Open Product, and clicking on the Manifest Safe product. And now your image is open. You will see that you have the metadata information, which describes all the details about the SAR image, what its mission is, the acquisition mode, its processing time, and all other details. And you will have other information that helps for geolocation, and you will have the bands that are available in the SAR image, which are amplitude, and a virtual band, which is intensity, which you have learned about. Our first step is to apply the orbit file. To do this, we go to the radar toolbar and we select apply orbit file. Here we have the IO parameters tab and the processing parameters tab. In general, in SNAP, as you know, the IO parameters tab will be giving you the information about the source product 
and the information about the target product. And it'll also tell you what the type of file is. So in our case, for applying the Orbit file, we would like to select the, the file that is in the Product Explorer. It will save that file with an underscore ORB so that you know that Orbit file has been applied. And we will select the folder in which we wish to save this. Next, you go to the pre-processing parameters. Here you will select your orbit state vectors, either Sentinel Precise or Sentinel Restituted. And Sentinel Precise is related to the five centimeter accuracy. You leave the polynomial degree at three and you hit run. The writing target product window will next come up and it will complete. Now, once your file has been orbit corrected, it will show up in your product explorer, but it will now have the underscore ORB as it in its name file. And you can see here, it has the same bands of amplitude VH and amplitude VV with the virtual intensity and virtual uh, intensity VB. You would close the apply orbit file and you've completed the first step of applying the orbit file. The next step in the process is to apply the speckle filter. Once again, you go to the radar tool and go into the speckle filtering selection. Here you'll see we have single product speckle filter and multi-temporal speckle filter, as I mentioned, was available in SNAP. In our scenario, we will select single product speckle filter. The toolbox window is opened, and once again, we have two parameters, two, two tabs, the IO parameters and the processing parameters. We want to ensure that our source product is file number two or the file with the underscore ORB. Our target pro product, you will see, will now be renamed to ORB underscore speckle or underscore SPK. In my case, I would save it to a directory called Sentinel1 underscore speckle. But in your case, you may feel you don't need to because all the subsequent files are saved with the information about what processing step has been applied. Under the processing parameters type, you would highlight the four amplitude and intensity channels, and then you would select your filter type. As we mentioned, at AEFC for the ACI, we use a gamma map filter with a seven by seven window size. Then we select run. And the writing target product window will come up and show you that it is writing. And there's more bands, so it takes longer. <laughs> So processing is completed and we close the main toolbox and we will see that our file is now in the product explorer with the underscore SPK. We can actually look at our speckled image by clicking on, right clicking on the intensity VH and opening a window. 
and we can compare it to the non-speckle filtered image by right clicking on the intensity v VH under the just orbit file corrected image. And we can tile our images horizontally. So you can see here, and by synchronizing our image cursors and synchronizing our image views, we can zoom in and see what the difference is when you apply the speckle filter. So our non-speckle filtered image is on the left and our speckle filtered image is on the right. And you can see here the salt and pepper nature of the non-speckled image as opposed to the more smoother and homogeneous fields of the non-speckled, of the speckled image. The next step that we would apply after we've done speckle filtering is to do the geometric correction by applying the range Doppler model and at this point do the radiometric normalization and conversion to sigma naught. Once again, we go into the radar tool and we go to geometric. We go to terrain correction and we select the range Doppler terrain correction. The tool window opens up and again, there are two tabs, IO parameters and processing parameters. We'll make sure that we're selecting the speckled filtered image and you'll see once again, it will give a underscore TC, which indicates that a terrain correction has been applied to that file. I again like to select, set mine in specific folders. Under processing parameters, we have more selections. First, we will highlight all the bands. And then we will select the digital elevation model we want to apply. In this scenario, we are looking at applying at SRTM one second HDT auto download digital elevation model. The SRTM one second HDT digital, auto, uh, digital elevation model has an overall resolution of approximately 30 meters. There are other options and you will need to determine which of these models is available over your specific region and will be the most appropriate for the information that you're looking at. You can also import an external digital elevation model if you happen to have one. We leave the digital elevation resampling methods alone. You can here change the map projection. In our case, we will leave it at WGS84. And it's here that we apply the radiometric normalization and save our data to the sigma naught. In our case, we will just simply use a local incidence angle from the digital elevation model. So once all the processing, processing parameters are selected, we will hit run. And once again, the writing target product window will come up showing that the product is being processed. I have these pre-processed. That takes, uh, you know, a good 20 minutes. So, and then your file should open in the product explorer and you will see it now has the underscore TC, close that. And you will see now we have different bands. We have sigma naught VHVV, 
we have local incidence angle image, we have a projected local incidence angle image, and then we have our sigma naught underscore VH using the local incidence angle from the digital elevation model. These are the bands or channels that we wish to use in our classification. But you will also notice they are virtual bands. This simply means that they have not been, uh, they are virtual information and they have not been converted into real images. And it is at this point that you right click on each of these and hit convert band, convert band, and you will save that product. So those will be saved and written as real actual products. This takes quite a bit of time as you're writing a 250 kilometer swath image and writing each pixel based on this new information from the calculations. I have these pre-processed. And now you have the corrected, speckle filtered, terrain corrected image. And again, we can close these image windows and look at the actual image. You can zoom in on the different areas and see what information you can see. Depending on your computer abil ability, rendering in on these images may take certain amounts of time. But this is a image that is ready to go into a crop classification. And this area is over Argentina. And you can see that these would be different fields, as would be some of these within here, and water bodies and towns, et cetera. Okay. Okay, that's it for the pre processing with the. SAR. The next part of your pre-processing are your steps for optical pre-processing. The steps would involve, if you have Sentinel-2 L1C data, you need to convert that and correct that to a bottom of atmosphere reflectance by using a Sen2 core atmosphere correction module. Please refer to the NASA RSET training by ESA for detailed instructions on how to apply the actual optical imaging pre-processing. So what I'm doing is subsetting um, Sentinel-1 imagery, co-registering Sentinel-1 imagery, and uh, exporting the files. Our next steps are subsetting, co-registering, and exporting our files to GeoTEF format. Next, you would make sure that your orbit file applied, speckle filter corrected, terrain corrected image is open and highlighted in your product explorer window. 
you would select the raster tool in the toolbar and select subset. It is here that you would put in your information about where you would wish to subset to. In our scenario, we have a smaller area that we will be classifying and therefore we want to relate our Sentinel-1 image to our Sentinel-2 images. And so we'll be using the extents or the geo coordinates of the Sentinel-2 image as our subset. So in this scenario, we would put in the subset coordinates and you will see as I enter subset coordinates, the window of interest starts to change. And our southern latitude And finally, our eastern longitude. Eastern longitude. <laughs> And you will see now we are actually taking only this section that we're interested in. <clears throat> and this is actually representative of an overlapping Sentinel-2 image. You will hit OK. And magically, it seems to have subsetted itself very quickly. The problem here is, is that it hasn't actually been written to file. We can open the image window and see the subsetted version. There you go. And we can open the subsetted window and we will see the actual subset of the full image that we were looking at. So again, we can zoom in and you'll see it renders a little bit better because the file is smaller and we can see the different fields and cities and water bodies, et cetera. You'll also notice over here that I have removed the four channels I am not interested in and I have then subsequently saved my product by just hitting save. Now you have the pre-processing and subsetting of Sentinel-1 imagery. We want to get them ready to go into the data stacks in conjunction with the Sentinel-2 imagery and the field data. Now in the next part of part four, you will see how to put in Sentinel-2 and the field data. But now we will co-register all the Sentinel-1 pre-processed data. For this site, we have approximately 10 images that we will be using from Sentinel-1. So now we will co-register the Sentinel-1 images and create them into a stack to be combined with Sentinel-2 and the field data for the classification. 
you can pre-process all your Sentinel-1 image either individually, as I've shown here, or you can do bulk image processing using the graphs in SNAP, as was shown in the previous trainings. Now we will open all our subsets that we want to co-register. In some ways, you may have learned you can also just drag and drop files into the Product Explorer, and they will all open up. So in this scenario, I have the 10 Sentinel-1 images that cover our area of interest, so cover the growing season. So if you're thinking of Argentina, the growing season starts in September of the previous year, 2018, and it goes approximately through to May of the following year, so 2019. So we will now co-register or put all of these images into one data stack so that we have one image that has all of these 10 bands or 20 bands in them. So once again, we go to radar and we go to co-registration and the co-registration window opens. Now in the product, we have different tabs. We have product set reader, we have create a stack, we have cross correlation, we have warp and we have write. So the product set reader is something like the IO parameters. This is where we're putting in what our, our products are that we want to stack. And in this, this scenario, I can simply add all the files that I have opened and they are stacked. They are in the product, the co-registration file. Next, we want to simply create a stack. Our initial offset method that we will use is product geolocation and our resampling type is just bilinear interpolation. Our op output extents are based on one of these options as being the, the primary extent that all other images in the stack will follow. So we can apply this find optimal master and generally this may or may not change to select a one or a different uh, image. We leave cross correlation and warp as is for default, and then we select right. And once again, you will see that stack is added to the end of a one of the stack is added in added to the end of the master's name, and that will be your stacked file that has all of your 20 bands in it. So we select a folder in which to save that. And we select run. And now we have our uh, master file with stack underneath, and you will see we have all band stack that file. And it's at this point, we would now export this from the beam DMAP uh, format that it is in for SNAP into a GeoTIFF format to be used in a different classifier or in uh, a different software. So all we do is go to File, Export, GeoTIFF, Big TIFF, and we select a location, and we can rename this if we don't want to keep all that information.
and we export our product. And this will take a while to write all this data to a GeoTIFF Big TIFF. Okay, that's subset coreg and export. Okay, and now you have a stack of co-registered and subsetted Sentinel-1 imagery to use with the classification with Python in the next section of the webinar series. And remember, we will have this training video on the web page within 24 hours so that you will be able to go through this at your own pace. So I thank you very much for listening and learning about the annual crop inventory and listening to how to do a crop inventory. And we will now send it back to our host. Please uh, write your questions in the question window and we will answer them in the order that they were received. We have been already collecting the questions that have been coming in and we've been putting them in a Google Doc which we will be sharing with participants shortly on screen. We will post this document on the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. If you have any questions about the material presented today, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson. Her email is here. Also, um, if you want to access the recordings or the presentations, they're all being posted on the RSET training page for this um, webinar series. Thank you very much, Dr. Dingle Robertson, for that great presentation and uh, thank you for participants for the questions coming in. We've been gathering them and we're now ready to start our question and answer session. Great. So let's uh, just work our way down the questions that we've already been assembling on our Google Doc. And uh, let's start with number one. Uh, how, do, how do you integrate send to core plugin offline in SNAP? So go ahead, Laura. Thanks, Erica. Um, good morning. All right. Uh, so there are instructions on ESA's website um, that will integrate the send to core offline uh, for SNAP. Um, and you, we provided you with the link for that. Um, and then similarly, and this is what we use, and I know a lot of people across, uh, across the world use it as well, um, the STEP forum is an excellent source of uh, resource in order uh, to ask questions on how to integrate that into your particular system. Um, there are ways to run send core when it's integrated in SNAP, or you can do it separately uh, using command line. Um, but again, those those links will be an excellent way to uh, to go and, and look at that. And, and similarly, um, the previous lecture in this series, lecture two, I'm pretty sure they probably spoke about send to core as well. So you can refer back to those videos as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some of some of, um, of send to core was discussed in the second session of this webinar series. So question two, how does one estimate sown area or cultivated area of crops using SAR data? Okay, so I think this came a little early in, in the questions, um, but uh, as we've shown, AFC has this robust method to integrate SAR and optical data to operationally map, cross, uh, map crops across Canada. Um, so this webinar uh, gives you the whole background on the pre-processing of the SAR data. Um, the previous uh, webinar, lecture two, would have given you the example on how to pre-process optical data. Um, and then the next webinar, uh, web webinar four on Thursday, will give you uh, the uh, instructions on how to uh, process, uh, use these data in a classification. Our webinar today also showed you how to do the field data collection 
Um, as well on Thursday, we will walk you through the whole post, uh, post classification process, including on how to publish your data. Okay, question three, how do you use ascending and descending pass Sentinel-1 images? So in our case, in an operational crop inventory, we use either pass. Uh, either pass can be utilized. Um, in some cases, there may be uh, you may be trying to avoid a pass um, that might be acquired when dew is present. Um, so generally, it's not necessary to exclude those images or stick to either descending or ascending. Um, and it's uh, also not necessary to sort of stick to a single incidence angle in a simple crop classification. Um, we talked about these issues with incidence angle or water and moisture and SAR. So we're asking that if you uh, go back to part one in this series and get a sense of how those things may have an influence. But generally in an operational crop classification, we're not specifically uh, singling out ascending only or descending only or simple uh, one type of incidence angle only. That's a great point. Okay, question four. What is single look complex and ground range detected? What is the difference? Okay, well, this also was covered in part one, but uh, briefly, so uh, single look complex SLC data are in the slant range, and that's the natural viewing geometry of SAR. Um, Heather had a really great uh, slide that sort of shows exactly uh, what that natural viewing geometry means, um, and the phase is preserved. The ground range detected data, GRD data, have been projected into an actual ground range and phase is not preserved. So if phase information is not required, uh, ground range detection is a good a choice for operations. Um, these products are easier to stack, they're easier to integrate with other geospatial data. And in the case of our um, current crop uh, operational crop inventory, um, we simply use ground range detected data. Okay, so now question number five, going back to send to core, can I use it to do terrain correction of a level 1C granule using a DM that covers it partially? Um, so typically for us, and again, um, the information on send to core definitely you'll you'll see um, about or can hear more about in part two. Um, but typically we use the DM that covers an entire area of a granule. Um, you can download DMs that that will cover the entire granules. Um, potentially there could be errors in the portion that are not covered by the DEM. Um, but again, for details on send to core only, um, you can refer to those links I mentioned above, um, as well refer back to part two of this lecture series. Okay, question number six. Do Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 satellites go over um, the area on the same day? Are, are they in some kind of um, a, a orbit, train orbit, where both optical and SAR data are acquired on the same day? So this is probably a question for ESA's uh, engineers, but um, it, I, I think it is, it's depending on where the images of acquisition are being acquired. Um, we do satellite calendars for some of our field surveyors just so that they can try and be out to match certain um, satellites for certain research projects. Um, and in southern Ontario, for example, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 are being acquired on sequential days. I suspect in Europe there's overlap, but again, this is probably a question for ESA and maybe looking at their sites, there are acquisition um, uh, uh, calendars, uh, both for Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. We can get a link for that. Okay, question number seven. Do the images from the Alaska Satellite Facility and the Copernicus Hub have the same name or ID? Uh, yes, I believe the naming convention is an ESA standard, so they would have the same, and it's, it's across the board so that everybody knows what type of imagery you're, you're looking at and the, the different dates and times. Mm -hmm. Question eight. A qu uh, what does a corrected file refer to? How does a correction process uh, produce? Or I so guess we were, 
Yeah, we weren't too sure about this question. Um, just that, again, we kind of went through the different correction steps, the geometric correction, the radiometric correction. Um, geometric correction is applied to relate the SAR image to a position on the Earth, and radiometric correction is necessary to correct for system errors and to provide accurate, me accurate measures of backscatter response per unit area. So I guess they could refer back to some of the details in, in this lecture, or uh, I believe Heather also mentions uh, this in part one again. Okay, question nine has two parts. First, is it correct to process Sentinel-1A and 1B images at the same time? And the second part touches on the previous question you answered, what happened with the ascending and descending? Is there any sort of, um, I guess, uh, error or noise that's introduced when using both at the same time? Okay, so as I mentioned, we have never experienced issues with using the two together. But again, um, we might sometimes try to avoid data that uh, were acquired when there was due in the field. Um, in operational contacts, it is imperative to acquire a time series of SAR imagery that captures the entire growing season. So for the AFC crop classification, um, in operational context, we use both. Um, you're going to have a trade-off between due effects, uh, differences in incidence angles, and maybe slightly different viewing directions, and a good temporal coverage. Um, but as we, Heather just t talked about during the SAR basics uh, refresher, um, if you're trying to just use SAR backscatter for change detection, it is important that your orbit and incidence angle are the same. So when you're just trying to do it for crop classification, um, it's not as important, but if you're trying to do change detection, you wanna make sure that orbit and incidence angle are the same. Yeah, that's a great point. Question 10, page 25 uh, or slide 25. The, you mentioned that the, the oh, the, you mentioned where the blue marked filters are implemented. Okay, so I, I think this refers to, so we did have uh, filters marked in blue, red, and green and in relation to just different types of available filters, speckle filters, and then um, ones that were available in SNAP and then ones that uh, uh, were not, and some of them were, were in blue. But uh, for the operational uh, crop inventory, we typically use a gamma map filter with a seven by seven or greater window size. Um, but what we really recommend with when you're trying to figure out what you're doing with your speckle filter is that you do tests on the filter type and the filter size. In some cases, a for a specific filter or one of those blue listed filters that we showed there, the multi-resolution, um, the um, uh, yeah, the multi-temporal, um, it may be more ap appropriate for your particular area of interest. Um, in our scenario, we found using the gamma map filter is uh, the best filter for us to use across the Canadian extent. But as we said, it's best to test these over several sites in your particular area. Okay, question 11, how do you determine the threshold of cloud cover with Sentinel-2 images? So typically we generally do not have a minimum threshold and we don't actually, um, when we're trying to look at uh, uh, optical imagery, we don't uh, give a min minimum threshold because we want to attempt to utilize all portions of images that are not covered in clouds. And sometimes when you put in a minimum threshold, it will knock out an image that may have a portion of it that is cloud free. Um, we do a little bit of a manual process by which we review our optical imagery um, to ensure that we can use all portions of viable images possible. Um, and as I said, by using a threshold, you may actually exclude some portions that might be um, cloud free, and it may be the only available imagery, optical imagery for a particular period of time. And it might be an important period of time for a certain, uh, in terms of growth and growth stage for a certain crop type. Great, question 12, what are LUTs, where can I find them and how do I use them? Well, there's many ways to use LUTs. Those are lookup tables and in general, they are provided in the satellite's metadata um, and they are incorporated into a wide variety of processing tasks um, like we showed, uh, such as radiometric conversion to SIGMANOT, for example. 
So in general, these are being incorporated in SNAP, for example, into some of the different SNAP modules and are used in the different calculations to produce um, a desired outcome, whether that's sigma naught or maybe that is in relation to geometric correction. But in general, when you go into SNAP, you can go and look at a, at a, a uh, satellite's metadata and you will be seeing a list of lookup tables in there. Question 13, can we access AAFC training system documentation? So the training systemization documentation is not currently available to the public to download, but um, Leander has kindly, I didn't do this, but Leander's kindly given his email address and um, you can send him a quick email and he'll pass along our training materials, particularly in relation to our field data uh, uh, training, um, and he can answer any additional questions that you may have. So his email is right there. Yeah. Super. Question 14, what is the other, what other type of information do you gather from the ground aside from crop type and how often do you go to the field? So besides crop types, um, data collectors can also add points for additional agricultural information. They may um, add information about if a field is fallow, um, if it has been harvested. Um, one uh, type of observation we do a lot of is too wet to be seeded. So um, obviously standing water in a field, the field can't actually be seeded. Um, they can also um, add various land cover types such as wetlands, forests, water, um, and then they have the ability to add additional notes um, to their different points. So either a field has a lot of weeds or crops are looking dry or stress. So within the particular um, observation survey tool, there is an option to add notes and these notes can then be reviewed back in the office when uh, trying to uh, prepare the data for, for the crop classifiers. Great, question 15, is there a similar software also available for data collection using free open source software? So any georeferenceable collection tool can be used as a data collection tool, obviously. So like a, uh, like a smartphone, um, we actually have surveyors out um, using their smartphones, um, but the method used by our operationals group um, they use GPS enabled tablets and they use this old Esri collection software called ArcPad. Um, the, recently, and in our research and development, we've started using um, a phone based application um, using Esri Survey123, um, and that unfortunately is proprietary. Um, but we've also experiment, experimented with, it's called NGA MAG data collection tool, and this has been used by the USDA's Foreign Agriculture Service. Um, and so you just go online to the App Store and, and look up NGA's MAG data collection tool. Okay, question number 16. There are lots of parts to this question, but it's all related to the data sample size. So for crop classification, um, using the training data, what is the data sample size and what should be the average farm size? In India, the average sizes are half a hectare, so is that farm size okay? Should we use at least 100 such farm data for training? And what is meant by well dispersed data? How do you differentiate between grain crops such as paddy, wheat, or what kind of training data sets should be considered? And what specific method could be used to distinguish crop type? So that's a lot of questions. So we have this roadmap, but we you have to understand, and we provided this roadmap, and this is what works very well in Canada and has been working for over 10 years. But there has to be some adaptation, um, and there will be some adaptation required to apply to your region of interest, depending on your cropping system, depending on your growing season, and obviously depending on your field sizes. Uh, Canada is pretty simple uh, cropping season. We have a very sort of May to September growing season and we have relatively very large fields. Um, for small fields, you want to consider higher resolution SAR modes um, and remember that the noise associated with SAR will require noise reduction, which Heather discusses in part one. Um, so as such, typically some type of averaging spatially or multi-looking will be needed. In terms of dispersion of training data, it's important to collect field observations across the area you wish to classify. 
um, because there may be a differences in seeding dates um, or meteorological conditions may create differences in crop development. So we differentiate between many, many different crop types, including grains and vegetables and oil seeds. Um, you will require samples of all the crop types you are trying to classify. So there's no simple answer to the number of field observations that you need. Um, it depends on the mixture of crop types, um, how different the SAR and optical signatures are among the crop types. So AFC's operations, this whole pro process began with research, and we actually continue uh, adapting our menu methods as we go to achieve the best results. So this is something that um, if you're looking at this is that starting with research, seeing what works across your area of interest, and then operationalizing it and then adapting as you go. Okay, question 17. Do you stratify the, sam the training sample collection so that you ensure sufficient training samples and are confident in capturing rare land cover classes? Do you calculate accuracies for land cover classes individually or overall? So um, our sample uh, class collections is not stratified, but given these guys have been out every year for the last 10 years, it's based on their knowledge of the areas. So areas with rare fields um, are usually are going to be sampled with a higher density. Um, so where they know that there are rare crop types being grown, they will go in there with a higher density. Um, in general, they publish overall crop uh, accuracies per province. Um, but individual crop classification accuracies are also computed, um, but they are not published. But they are also available on request and are listed on our opencanada.ca as being available on request from the Earth Observation Team. Great. Question 18. Do you publish the crop maps and training data? So yes, as I just mentioned, everything is published on opencanada.ca. Um, and the annual crop inventory maps are found at that link there. And the ground truth points that have been collected by our Earth Observation Team, so this is not the data that's provided by the provincial crop insurance companies, can all be found there. So all uh, 10 years worth of uh, crop classification points can be found at that site. Question 19. Since Landsat and Sentinel-2 imagery have different resolutions and bandwidth, how can they be combined and used in the same study? So um, you can combine them by resampling one to the other spatial resolution, um, for, uh, uh, for uh, comparing the spatial resolution. Um, similarly, uh, Sentu-Agri, which I believe will be uh, discussed a little bit in uh, part five um, and is available through ESA and what I believe is called MLS data that is being produced by the USGS. Um, they have an attempt to normalize the bandwidth between the two imagery types to be used in um, an optical type time series. Um, but you can uh, go online and uh, look at Sentu Agri at the link that we provide there. And then similarly, I believe you can check out USGS's sites for details on, and I believe it's MLS. I'll double have to double check that, but it's uh, where they're trying to normalize between Landsat and Sentinel so they can be used in time series. Okay, question 20 is the same one as question 18, so we will skip that one. And question 21, that's been answered too in uh, question 16, so we'll go over that one skip over it. And then let's go to question 22. In my understanding, fields are classified according to the view from the roads driven during AAFC field surveys. This assumes that the road view crop is representative of the entire field. Can you provide an estimate of the error that entails this assumption? So data collectors are instructed to place their observation point only in the area they can see. So they're not trying to assume that a whole field is growing in a uniform crop type. Um, when they run the segmentation process that we, we described in the lecture um, over the imagery um, with the observation point, we then associate uh, the observation at that point to that 
polygon that is created during the segmentation uh, process. But uh, uh, nothing is perfect. And they've had conversations, our Earth Observation Team with uh, USDA. Um, uh, the decision tree methodology that they use in, for their crop classification can handle up to 20% uh, training data error and still produce an acceptable map. Um, but of course, they never really want to be uh, near that percentage. So it's always kind of a trade-off here um, in terms of your development of your field tra field training data, what you can feasibly do. It's yeah, driving along roads is is one of the only ways that you can feasibly get that many training samples um, in a in a, such a large area, uh, you know, as Canada's extent. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Okay, question 23. Do you do the survey every year? Yes, uh, we survey for every growing season. That's July through August. And we sample the information every year where it's not made available. So for all those provinces that I listed in, in the summary table, um, we do that every year. Um, and then for the other provinces, we receive uh, information from crop insurance agencies. Okay, question 24. Do you, have you considered using bikes instead or in conjunction with cars, which would eventually allow access to more fields? And how about drones? So uh, considering we're very, like Canada is a very large place um, and we have very large areas to sample. So um, it becomes an impossible task to do by bikes even in conjunction with cars. Similarly, we have um, privacy uh, requirements and we are not allowed to simply go on to a farmer's field to make observations. Um, we would have to obtain permission from the farmer um, and that, that's quite a log logistical uh, problem. So um, with drones, um, there are issues again with permissions, um, with where drones can actually be flown in Canada and with weather. Um, so it's a bit too complicated right now to be used operationally. Okay, question 25, which builds on question 24. Is it possible to ask all the farmers in a specific region to indicate on a map what the crop type is on each of their farmland? Okay, yep. Um, and yeah, and then the, the he went along to talk about um, uh, in Netherlands, the farmers actually register their plots every year. Um, so this, this, this source of uh, data in the Netherlands sounds like a very excellent source of in-situ data if they're required to register their plots every year. And if um, you can uh, gain access to that data, I don't know if there's privacy issues around that. Um, in Canada, farmers are not required to do that kind of registration. Um, we mentioned that we are able to acquire crops insurance data from some provinces, um, but there are very strict rules and agreements between ourselves and those provinces that have allowed us to use those data. Um, and again, in those provinces where we cannot obtain uh, that type of data, we do the field surveying ourselves. Okay, tw question 26. How do you ensure that your training set is representative of the study area? How can you determine the sampling density before even starting? Is there any formula, ratio, expression, or tips in addition to being familiar with the region of interest? Is the choice of sampling site only related to the landscape heterogeneity level in terms of lithology, uh, geographic formation, soil types, land cover and land use, and so on? Um, so we are not using any quantitative rules to determine our sampling density in Canada. So in areas where there's lots of field diversity, um, we sample as much as possible along those driving routes. Um, again, the samples should be di well distributed across the entire mapped area. Um, and this will help collect data in areas that might have experienced a microclimate di uh, differences like wet, drought, wet or dry, um, if there's pests or disease infestation. Um, as, as we saw in the first le lesson from uh, Dr. McNairn, um, there was sampling across the entire area of interest will help with the near and far range issues with SAR data. Um, we will also focus on uh, more sampling in areas with rarer crop types, as I mentioned. Um, so in general, the more samples, the better for these crops, um, for the decision tree methodology that we're using, um, and 
the decision tree will start to be biased to the more common crop types, um, given there's uh, ro more robust sampling for those crops. So for rare and uncommon crops, you want to get as many samples as you possibly can. Okay, question 27. When applying the terrain correction, can you use a higher resolution DEM? And what would be the effects? So you could use a, a higher resolution DEM to apply the terrain correction, but um, you'll use any additional benefits from this as you're limited by the pixel resolution of the original image. image. Um, so in fact, a higher resolution DEM could potentially slow down the processing time, time because it's more detailed and likely a larger field size. So um, trying to match the same resolution as your, your original imagery might be a more appropriate approach. Okay, the next question, number 28, if we want to automate this process, can this be done in Earth Engine or um, is there a separate script in Python? So yeah, so all of these processes that I ran with Snap can be um, automated using Python. So Snap has a version of Python called SnapPy um, and you can incorporate that and call all those modules um, that uh, that I showed in the uh, online pre-processing. Um, similarly, you can run all of that processing in um, uh, as a batch processing option. And I'm not 100% sure, but potentially in part two, they described um, how to do batch processing in SNAP, but you can write a graph for all the processes in your pre-processing and then run um, multiple, multiple images um, using the batch processing and SNAP. Okay, question 29. Is there a suggested approach to subset your image before correcting it in order to reduce computational time? Or is there a reason not to do it? So simply to subset your image, to be able to subset it to a known area of interest, you actually need to know where your image is. So it does have to be terrain corrected and projected into, into a, a, a known geometric, uh, a known place on the earth. So you would have to do that first. So um, yeah, you, you need to, you kind of need to know where you are before you can subset an image down um, for sure. Okay, question 30. Why didn't you apply a radiometric calibration? So you might have missed it, but um, it was applied during the terrain correction in the SNAP. So if you refer back to um, once the video is posted, you can go through and run through the SNAP processing again. Um, but in SNAP, if you're writing, uh, applying a radio calibration that is uh, that you want to be more precise using a digital elevation model, use the pro process within the terrain correction module. Um, in some cases, you may not wish to do this, um, and subsequently you can apply uh, that type of radio uh, correction first um, prior to your speckle filtering. And in SNAP, that's going in the radar um, tool and hitting calibrate and then calibrate to sigma naught. Okay, question 31. Do SAR images have to be corrected for atmospheric interference? So, so no, no, you don't need to do an atmospheric correction uh, for SAR data. Um, and and uh, this is only for optical data. Um, they're obviously passive systems and they're looking at energy reflected and emitted from the earth. Um, and as Heather's mentioning right now, SAR satellites are their own microwave energy source um, and they have longer wavelengths than optical satellites and are not impacted by atmosphere particles. And Heather really describes this um, in the first, in the first uh, portion of the, or first part of the whole series. So you might want to review that as well. Okay, question 32. Can Sencor be used to perform a terrain correction or is it necessary to implement a routine analysis to do it? S so I would refer back to um, the first question on terms of what Centucor can and cannot do. Um, typically, my understanding is it's um, terrain corrected prior to download. Um, and then, so there's not a necessary, it's not necessary to do a terrain correction on Sentinel-2 imagery, um, but I would refer either back to part two of this lecture series and the links that we provided above on Centucor. All right, question number 
33. For the slide where you showed human resources uh, needed to create the uh, uh, crop inventory by province, there was, I didn't see any information on the prairie provinces. Is ground data for those areas provided entirely by the crop insurance companies? Um, that's correct. So the crop insurance agencies um, with an agreement with um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada provide the crop, inf um, it, crop information um, for those provinces. Um, and so that that is correct. We do not do any surveying, any ground surveying um, on an operational context in those provinces. In research and development, we actually do some similar types of crop surveying, um, but obviously in more uh, smaller areas, um, more focused um, for research. So, but for the operational, the crop insurance agencies provide that information. Okay, question 34. Is there any disadvantage in applying the thermal, thermal noise removal and radiometric calibration before terrain correction? So for thermal noise removal, and I believe our, our, our partners with Copernicus Roos will actually, uh, they actually include that in their processing chain, but we, we haven't seen any sort of advantage or disadvantage in completing the thermal noise removal, and it's not currently part of our processing chain. Um, for radiometric correction, we've done some initial assessment, um, and as Heather mentioned, in relation to when using wide swath uh, Sentinel-1 imagery, it can be important to apply that normalization using the digital elevation model and local incidence angle because the difference between the values of the class types um, on either side of the images can be significant. Okay, question 35. The semi-automatic classification plugin for QGIS provides a toolkit to pre-process Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 imagery. Are those tools built on the SnapPy Python module? If not, what are the main differences between the pre-processing in Snap and in the semi-automatic classification plugin? So I'm not familiar at all with this semi-automatic classification plugin for QGIS, but I would assume that someone on that ESIS for, forum would be very uh, familiar with this. And my recommendation would be uh, going on the STEP forum and just posting your question um, because I'm sure someone has, has attempted to try this and uh, they, they would be able to give a little bit more insight, but um, we, we do not use that, that tool. Okay, question 36. Uh, with SNAP, how do you subset irregular shaped study areas? Can we use uh, already prepared area of interest like a shape file or another type of raster? So typically, I'm not subsetting to irregular shaped study areas using SNAP. So it's it's not something that I've I've sort of um, uh, investigated myself. Um, subsequently, uh, you can pull your whole pile, a stack of data. If you've stacked like um, Sentinel-1 images, uh, you can pull those all out and sub, uh, subset them using uh, Python or another another source uh, for subsetting. We have proprietary tools at AFC that we can use for subsetting um, if we want an irregular shaped uh, AOI, but typically if I'm using SNAP, I'm using simply uh, square or rectangular shape areas, and so they're not they're not irregularly shaped. Again, I would check the forum. That's always a great place. And uh, yep. Okay, question 37. How can I use the Mage app in my country? The app asks for a server URL. So Mage, uh, the software is open source, but you need to host your own server um, so that you can manage the database and the actual software. So um, what you would do is then um, you would create your own server to host your Mage application and then send that out to your surveyors to use for surveying. And I don't know, Leander might have a link that we can add in terms of more details and resources on using Mage. We'll get that oh. for you guys. Okay. Question 38. How does AAFC estimate accuracy of the crop inventory maps? 
So the data are being collected um, either by the field work or from crop insurance data, and we divide that into 70% um, training data, and we have 30%, which is our reference or validation data. And that 30%, it's set aside. We don't use it for any training or testing. It's uh, solely used to validate the maps. Okay, question 39. The, the crop insurance industry, I want to use Sentinel-1 data for different crops in the Indian region, which are comprised of small fields. How, please suggest how do I do this? I guess, how do you access the crop insurance data? So again, this is a roadmap and you will require some adaptation. Um, if they're not available to you, you'd have to consider collecting in situ field observations um, to getting the training and validation data. But if there is crop insurance data available in your area, you'd have to investigate um, all sort of the issues and regulations surrounding that data and the availability of that data. So that would have to be specific to, to India and your, your area of interest. Okay, question 40, are you creating a new crop model each year or are you using the field data collected each year to increase the accuracy of the previous year's model? Do you also collect field data for crop yields, e.g. from farmer interviews, to ground truth your yield forecasts? So new models are created each year. Um, farmers uh, answer surveys about their yield estimates to Statistics Canada, which is another Canadian um, government department. Um, and this information is incorporated with other information such as current growth season, weather information, historical weather information, yield data, um, and other factors to estimate what the current field uh, yield is forecasted to be. So um, for, for the crop uh, classification, new models are uh, created each year. All right, the next question, number 41, how can we use Sentinel-1 data for soil moisture? Please go through the full methodology using C-band. Okay, so um, there are no, a number of different modeling approaches, um, uh, and this is uh, something that uh, uh, Dr. McNairn's team has been working on for many years, but uh, these are obviously empirical, semi-empirical, physical modeling. Um, SNAP does have a soil moisture toolkit that applies the IEM physical model, but this requires HH and VV to run the original IEM or VV using two different incidence angles to run the hybrid IEM. Um, so the IEM could be a challenge to apply with Sentinel-1 as typically imagery are not acquired in HHVV, um, which is used needed for the original IEM. And um, using the uh, hybrid IEM, there's typically uh, a time difference between the first and second Sentinel-1 image. So there's some promising methods to retrieve soil moisture using Sentinel-1 backscatter. Um, it's just published. So there's a link there to that, that article. And this has been tested over several sites, and including some in, in Canada as well. All right, question 42, can we change the file format while performing co-registration? Uh, yes, you can. So in any point when you're trying to save uh, out of SNAP, you can uh, save the file format uh, to a different uh, format. And there's a, when you do the drop down, uh, when you're saving or, or print, uh, writing out, there's options there for GeoTIFF, BigTIFF, other uh, formats that may be more compatible to different softwares that you're using. Okay, question 43, great question. And how, how do you use polarimetric decomposition for crop classification techniques? So um, the AFC ACI uses obviously VV and VH backscatter. Um, however, there's a significant amount of research ongoing by AFC and many other scientists to the use the um, to assess the use of polarimetric parameters for crop classification. Um, obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we use RaiderSat constellation mission data, which has um, uh, uh, availability of operational compact telemetry um, information. So we are very interested in the use of polarimetric parameters for crop classification. So in general, we see improved accuracy when integrating uh, more polarimetric rich data layers, um, so including decomposition layers. 
Um, and a polymetric decomposition channel, such as volume scattering, could simply be integrated into either the decision tree or random forest classifier, much in the same way that a VV or VVVH backscatter would be, a layer would be integrated. So similarly, you could think of this in generating, you would need SLC data, um, but you would generate your polymetric parameters and then similarly use the channels of interest like volume scattering from a decomposition, um, different uh, uh, aspects like degree of linear polarization or Stokes vectors, things like that, you could add simply as uh, channels uh, in the classifiers. All right, the next question, can we use a hybrid classification such as KNN or KD classifiers for different minor crop classifications? So there are a lot of different classification methodologies that are utilized for crop classification. Um, so again, this really relates to um, what is in the literature um, and what works well in your particular area of interest. Um, typically, what we're finding is that uh, these machine learning uh, methodologies like decision tree, random forest, and then moving into the deep learning uh, methodologies like artificial intelligence, neural nets, um, are methodologies that are more commonly used now um, for these, these classifiers and are pro performing well and are performing well operationally. Um, as I mentioned, operationally, we use a decision tree classifier, but I believe in the next um, uh, next uh, session on Thursday, we will be describing how to use random forest classifier, which we've shown in our research um, has uh, uh, shown to improve on overall crop classification accuracies, and our operational team is subsequently uh, evolving and including that methodology in their in their in their methodology moving forward. So, as I mentioned. We have been doing this classification method uh, for the last 10 years, but through time, we continue to do research and development to improve it and, and change as, as we go through time. All right, question 45, is co-registering an S2 image the same as co-registering an S1 or S1 images? So um, I believe this is actually being covered on Thursday. So I will, I, I think I can leave it to that, but we will cover that on Thursday when they're developing their data stacks of the optical from part two and the SAR from part three into whole, all of part four. Yes, that is correct. This will be covered on Thursday. Yeah. Question 46, for operational mapping purposes, is it important to consider either the ascending or descending pass of Sentinel-1 as well as incidence angles. So this has been answered before. Yeah. Um, we'll reference the uh, question where you can find the answer. Question 47, can your incident to ground truth crop survey data be used for training and validation for different years? So currently our, our current operational approach does not allow for that right now. Um, so every year we're treating it as a new um, unique classification and we're receiving both the insurance data and in situ data on a, on a yearly ba basis. And the majority of farmers actually re rotate their crops in each field annually. Um, but there's nothing to be said that um, this cannot be looked into um, on, an, on an aspect in your particular area that you could use data from previous years to classify uh, New Year's, maybe with a minimal addition of new data. But again, this, this would require further, further research. At question 48, does the order of speckle filtering in a pre-processing chain matter? So we did a lot of testing on this um, it, during an experiment um, with what's called the JCAM SAR to comparison experiment, which looked at applying the AAFC operational crop methodology on sites across the world. And one of the steps or one of the, 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 the research we looked into is, um, does order of operations matter? And what we found is that it matters in terms of a timing uh, aspect. And so that uh, completing the speckle filtering first reduces the amount of time overall on a large scale um, as opposed to doing terrain uh, correction first. So we put the paper there. Um, uh, you can refer back to the paper for sort of that ideas about how that, how that, that improves based on when speckle filtering is applied. 
All right. Uh, question 49, do you use principal component analysis for reducing redundancy in the in-situ data and thereby reducing the sample size? So yes, uh, we use it uh, for the Sentinel-2 data to reduce the number of bands that go into the classifier. And this is just a, to avoid currently computer memory issues for us. Question 50, how do you examine radar issues such as foreshortening and overlay before using the data in the mountains? Um, so it is very difficult to remove the effects of foreshortening, foreshortening and layover. Um, obviously, a good DEM will assist with geometric correction, but the SAR response is still going to be distorted in the landscapes. Um, ascending or descending orbits may provide a different look over the terrain, um, and you can collect that data in those different orbits to see if that will help you. Um, otherwise, um, as it was covered in part one, that you may have to actually mask out those terrains. Typically, um, in, in Canada, in the agriculture extent, this is not something that we have to be very concerned with. All right, question 51. I think you've answered this one before, too, in terms of ascending and descending and integrating the backscatter. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to skip this in the interest of time. Uh, question 52, do you have any correction factor to deal with precipitation occurrence in SAR data? So no, um, if there is precipitation during SAR acquisitions, um, the microwaves will be scattered by the rain droplets. Um, so the SAR image is obviously washed out in the sense there's going to be differences in the backscatter between the fields, um, but, and the differences in the backscatter between the fields is lost, and scattering observed on the image is due to the scattering by these droplets. Um, so it is important, if you can, to eliminate the SAR data that are acquired during rain events. And we can put up a link to um, a pretty neat uh, 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 Twitter series that actually shows um, an image that has that rain event phenomenon going across it. And you can, you can really see the, uh, the difference there. Okay, question 53. I get an error when I run apply orbit file. It says a problem occurred during the target production initialization. How do I resolve this? So um, this error is related in, to a change in the depository or default repository that's used by SNAP to automatically download the Sentinel-1 orbit data. And so that's change. Um, so the orbits actually need to be downloaded manually from the STEP repository or for Copernicus Sentinel's POD data hub. So we've provided those links below. And then you place them in your respective folders. So you'll see that all there. Um, and then sorted by type, platform, year, and month. Um, the orbit should be uh, in an individually zipped archives and can be downloaded from the step repository. Um, and so that kind of gives you uh, the, the response on how to do that. Okay, question 54. If the same crop was sown in two different dates, can the classification algorithm detect this or will the result be two different crops? So spectrally, uh, spectrally, the same crop will appear the same. Um, they will just be at slightly different stages of their development. And so by monitoring over a full growing season, uh, acquiring imagery through the whole growing season, this difference is negated. Um, but right now we're doing other research um, that exploits these SAR scattering parameters to detect crop growth stages um, using, for example, machine learning algorithms. So um, we're trying to see if we can actually detect those growing stages and specifically if they're seeded at different dates, can we see those differences? All right, question 55, what is the difference between co-registration and geocoding? When combining radar and optical data, do you stack the images? And if so, which one do you use as a reference for spatial resolution? So again, I think they're going to talk about this in part four, but co-registration, that's geometrically aligning a data set with another data set that's already georeferenced. And geocoding is actually assigning a georeference to the data set. So optical and radar data are geocoded to the same projection resolution extent. Um, and then for now, this is with our operational um, uh, for our operational methodology, we're just using Landsat 8 resolution at 30 meters for all of our data sets. Data sets. 
All right, question 56, who are the users of the crop monitoring and classification results and for what and how are they using it? Okay, well, there are many, many uh, numerous end users of the data and this ranges all from federal, provincial and local governments and this is for policy development. Um, private industries are using it such as rail transportation and grain ele elevators, our disease and pest scientists um, are uh, using it, looking for fields that don't rotate crop types frequently. So they'll use the whole time series of their different crop maps. Um, so there are many others, and this is just a quick example. And we can see if our Earth Observation team can provide some of their use case scenarios um, in a link for you guys. Great. Question 15, is it important to gather ground data at the same time the S1, S2, L8 pass? Um, over your area? So it's not necessarily important. Um, the crops will remain in the field for numerous satellite passes when you're looking for crop identification mapping. So in some of your countries where you might have um, multiple crops, so double crops um, that are grown in what we call a single growing season, it put, should be necessary to actually capture both crop types grown in those fields though. So you just want to make sure you're capturing what's going on um, if it's sort of a single crop type growing in a single season, uh, you can go in and look at that and observe that. But if you have these double crops, you may have to go back and observe that again. All right, question 58. How do you deliver your results? How often and in what format, et cetera? So we're going to show you at the end of part four on Thursday what we do after the fact, after the classification is completed. Um, but in general, data is distributed about a few months after the end of our growing season. And all provinces are uh, distributed typically no later than February the following year. And that could be related to um, the, the year and, and what was going on in the particular year. So the format right now is GeoTIFF. It's 30 meter resolution and it's available by province. And we've given you the link to that again. Question 59, can the annual crop inventory be applied in tropical countries? So for example, in Indonesia, the Department of Agriculture used the standing crop method using remote sensing imagery for rice field factual condition in the ground. So as we're saying, this is a roadmap. This is something that you can use um, and, and using our experience on how we develop this for Canada. Um, and as I said, we've also been testing this roadmap in other regions, particularly through the JCAM SAR into comparison experiment and through other ongoing endeavors. Um, and we ran this um, to test these methods over different cropping systems. Um, there will probably be some adaptations that are required. Um, as we said, Canada's growing, uh, Canada's agriculture is pretty simple. It grows through a simple period from May to September. And, uh, you know, so it's pretty simple, but it may have to be adapted to apply it in your particular region. Um, we do have, again, another link to the paper of the results that we had from applying these methods in those different places around the world during the JCAM SAR digital comparison experiment. So you can check that out and, and see sort of where we found things uh, worked well and maybe didn't work well. All right, question 60. Could we use Google Earth Engine to do the co-registration process for Sentinel-2 or is there a similar method to do this? So I'm going to defer that question to our, our, our friends with Copernicus Roos to answer on, on, uh, on um, Thursday. Um, they would probably be able to let you know what you can do in Google Earth Engine or not. Okay, great. Question 61. One of the early slides mentioned something about land cover data that's updated every five years. Is an independent land cover data product being used to mask the areas to be classified or is establishing a cropland mask part of the classification process and the data referenced used in some other way? 
So a random selection of the training sites from the existing land cover, so non-agricultural maps, is used to classify the entire agricultural extent using the current year imagery. So then you have what is called um, an uh, ag and non-ag, basically, uh, outcome. And crop classification is then performed on what would be classified as agriculture in that initial classification. So in a way, it is like a cropland mask. Okay, question 61, a random selection, oh, sorry, 62, what is the minimum number of samples we should take for a particular plot for model development, and how does one decide? So in the literature, there's a lot of um, information on numbers of samples um, that are needed for particular models. Um, these can range anywhere from 30 to 50 samples per crop type, but obviously that's not always possible. So what you're looking for is as many, many samples as, as, as you can, especially for rare and unusual classes um, that are, are present in the field or in the, in the region. Okay, question 63. Correction of the terrain is quite useful using a digital elevation model. What is the standard error doing this and how much can we rely on these data? I'm going to get back to you on that question. Um, I just want to be able to, I haven't actually gotten to 63 yet, so I wanted to be able to have some moment to actually think about that and answer that. So we will make sure that we answer that question and get back to you. All right, question 64. I work in a data scarce environment and was wondering how the crop signature for wheat could be applied to developing countries. So we haven't done a lot of testing on generic crop signatures like wheat um, and how those could be applied over time and space. So specifically over in your, your area, taking a signature for wheat from another area and applying it to your area. Um, this would be really challenging because obviously signatures are different due to the different cultivars, the different seeding dates, um, the different meteorological conditions. Um, but we're looking at new like uh, artificial intelligence methods, uh, neural networks um, to assess the transferability of signatures. So that, um, a but that all really depends on a really robust training set. Um, and ensuring that a robust training set can be developed. And, and by robust, we mean many, 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 many samples. So there is a lot of research on this, um, on transferability of signatures. Um, so that would be something you'd want to start looking at in terms of uh, what's in the literature. All right, question 65. What vegetation indices and bands are used for crop classification? So spectrically, um, and this is operationally, for the op optical uh, imagery, we use the visible and infrared bands. So with Landsat 8, which is typically what our operational methodology was um, uh, based on, uh, we used, well, we actually based it on, obviously, Landsat 5, but bands 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So that would be red, green, blue, near infrared, and the two shortwave infrareds. Um, with Sentinel-2, what we've tried to do is simply match those similar bands, um, which for Sentinel-2, we've listed out those similar bands. But that's not to say, like, Sentinel-2 has some really sort of great, uh, the red edge bands and things like that. So it's always important to try incorporating uh, the different information as much as possible. Um, so uh, these are used, and the SAR data provides the information, obviously, in the microwave portion. And as we mentioned, we're using the VV and VH uh, uh, from uh, C-band currently. So that's based on having uh, access to radar sat 2 and now radar sat constellation mission data, um, and now as well Sentinel-1 data. But that's not to say that in the future it would be important to incorporate other frequencies of SAR data, uh, like L-band data uh, for when the NISAR uh, satellites are launched and, and so forth. So it's always important to consider what's going on now, but also what can potentially happen in the future and what you can gain from adding in other data in the future. Question 66, can we use Google Earth Engine for pre-processing Sentinel-1 data? 
Okay, so this is a good answer. We don't use Google Earth Engine um, at all on our aspect um, uh, due to some different issues. As I've mentioned, we use Radar Set Constellation Mission. We have proprietary uh, uh, processing, but apparently Sentinel-1 data is already pre-processed on Google Earth Engine except for the pen speckle filtering. So you can refer to those guides uh, there. All right, question 67. How do you account for the changes in the backscatter near range and far range when using ascending and descending together? And so, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and, and how much difference in backscatter can be expected between ascending and descending? Okay, so the annual crop inventory deals with this by using images with overlapping footprints. So in the far range, one SAR scene will be in the near range and the other scene. So both in the DSC and ASC orbits. Um, the stacking of the star images helps negate the issues over the entire area of interest, but also you really need to try and collect training data across the entire SAR swath in both the near and too far ranges. So just kind of keeping that in mind um, in an operational perspective. All right, question number 67. The annual crop inventory deals oh. with this. Oops, I'm sorry. No, we just did that one. <laughs> yeah. 68. Is co-registering in SNAP equivalent to mosaicing in Google Earth Engine? I, again, I am not familiar with Google Earth Engine. We're not using that in our current operations or uh, for research and development. So I'll leave that to either uh, Copernicus Roos to answer on uh, Thursday or even maybe Erica, you can let us know. <laughs> Yeah, I've never done a comparison by side by side, so I'm I'm not able to answer this one. Question 69. Do you measure spectral distance between crop types, something like what Jeffrey's Matusita is doing, and then using this for determining the time interval on the basis of which you create a mosaic? Uh, no, we we do not do uh, measurement of the spectral difference between crop types right now. Um, as we said, we uh, if you're referring to the difference on um, either side of the swath images uh, for SAR imagery, um, we have done some initial assessment of the signatures because we have uh, in, situ in situ data on either sides of, of imagery and we've compared the signatures of uh, same crop types across swath. Um, so we've done a bit of uh, analysis in that manner, but no, we haven't applied this spectral distance application. All right, so that was the last question. Wow, um, amazing job, uh, Laura, in answering all of those questions. And um, as we mentioned earlier, this Google Doc will go online so you can reference the answers um, uh, on a later date as well. So with that, then we've reached the end of this session. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson for her great presentation and handling all of these questions. I'd also like to thank other members of AAFC who've been online answering the questions on the Google Doc, Leander Capel, Heather McNairn, and Thierry Fizet. I'd like to thank our, our RSET team, uh, the team that makes this possible, Brock Levins, Jonathan O'Brien, and Selwyn hudson Odoi, and RSET instructors, Amita Mehta and Sean McCartney. And um, with that, uh, before we close, uh, Laura, any last words before we close? Sure. Thank you, Erica. Um, in, just to let you know, in part four, we will pick up where we left off um, exploring the files with uh, Copernicus Roos, um, and we'll talk about the classification portion of the crop roadmap, and we'll go through the final steps of the post process. So going through publishing and thing and 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 those and publishing it to uh, the public. Um, and uh, thanks very much. This has been a, an awesome opportunity. So we really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. And thank you to all for the participants. Stay tuned at the same time on Thursday for session number four and the second part of this crop inventory roadmap. Wishing you all a great day. Bye-bye.